Dave Ward and Friends is proud to be supported by the brand new 135,000 plus square foot Porsche River Oaks dealership from our friends at Sonic Automotive. I've known a lot of Porsche owners in my time and one thing they've told me is that they really enjoy sitting down and specking out the Porsche of their dreams. The newly opened River Oaks Porsche will not only allow you to do that, but Porsche North America has broadened the allocation of all model types just for this new state-of-the-art River Oaks facility. General Sales Manager Carrie Jo McCrory and her entire team are excited to get you into the personalized Porsche of your dreams. It's now open in River Oaks. Tell them Dave Ward sent you. Well, Houston, we've been through a lot together. We started in radio 60 years ago. It was such a great gig, my father cautioned me against going into this thing called television, but we did it, and we had a pretty good run. We even went from black and white to color TV, then to high definition. I keep hearing about streaming and digital, and well, it's a chance to reconnect with my friends and viewers and share stories from our times together throughout these last six decades. What do you say, Houston? Let's do this. Hello friends, I'm Dave Ward, and welcome to Dave Ward and Friends. This is a series of casual conversations with people I have met and friends I have made over my 60 years of radio and television news broadcasting in Houston. Today, I am honored to be in the home of a man who was so well known in NASA, in the space program, Gene Kranz flight director. I don't really know what all you did out there, Gene, but you sure did it good. I don't remember where we met. We must have met at one of the launches you controlled. Uh, do you remember? I, I really don't have a clue. Basically, uh, uh, my focus was on my team and mission control, getting ready to fly. Uh -huh. And when the time came, be on top of the job. I was basically the quarterback playing in the red zone throughout every mission I ever worked. And you started with the Gemini program? No, I actually started Mercury. In Mercury? I, I was here for the uh, first uh, Mercury, first Redstone launch in Mercury, and this is the fam famous one where he went down to the Cape, got the countdown, counted down, you see lift off and a burst of smoke, and we launched the escape tower. The rocket is still on the launch pad. <laughs> and we had a live rocket with the destruct system armed, and we did not know what to do. That was my introduction to space in the business of mission control. Well, you finally got that first uh, Mercury Redstone flight off the ground. Yes, we did. The first astronaut was Alan Shepard, wasn't it? Yes, not? he was. Uh, a suborbital flight. And yes, in fact, it's funny is that uh, when we were down at the Cape, the majority of the mission control team, computer programmers were such a rarity that they always worked prime shift. Uh -huh. So mission controllers, flight directors, test team frequently worked the swing shifts and the graveyard shift. Uh -huh. And uh, we'd always go out to the end of the motel and look and see if the lights were on on the pad. If the lights were on on the pad, we'd get the car and drive out there. If not, we'd stay, go back to bed. Uh -huh. I'll be darned. You once told me that it took the Apollo 13 movie that was directed by Ron Howard to make your kids really understand what you did at NASA. Do you think that film, was it an accurate betrayal of the actual events? Dave, I think that the, uh, the key element of that film was it portrayed the intensity of the work that we did. And I think it portrayed my flight control team, the flight directors, uh, the urgency, uh, the crisis mode that mission control can go into. And it looks, in real world, it looked like everybody's uh, asleep at the console. Okay, but 
Ron Howard and Ed Harris made that room come alive. And in fact, if uh, Ed Harris was around at the time we were flying Apollo 13 and available, I would have made him a flight director. <laughs> yes, you once told me in an interview years ago that until that film, Apollo 13, came out, your children really didn't know what you did there at NASA, but when they saw that you were portrayed by the actor Ed Harris, they looked at you in a totally new light. Well, what was interesting is uh, number three daughter, we have five daughters and one son. Uh -huh. Number three daughter worked in mission control down in the computer complex, and once she saw that film coming out, and they were showing it at various theaters in the uh, Clear Lake area, mm -hmm. uh, she got tickets for the midnight showing there for her entire workforce down there. Uh -huh. And after we watched the movie, then we went and had pizza. So that was when I became uh, known uh, yeah. in mission control. <laughs> Did you like the actor who, play, who played you in that movie? I think Ed Harris did a uh, superb job. Yeah. I think he was coaching, but it was sort of cheating because two of my flight controllers went out to coach him during the filming. Mm -hmm. uh, Jerry Griffin went out. He was another flight director that worked during the Gemini and the Apollo program. And, uh, and Jerry Bostic, the trajectory guys. So basically, they say, no, Crans wouldn't do this or that right around the line. So they got it pretty well. In fact, if you notice there, he, uh, I destroyed ballpoint pens. Uh, the secretary would bring me a brand new box there, and all through the mission, when I'd get nervous, I'd be punching that thing pretty soon, it'd be fall apart. <laughs> Parts all over the floor, a wastebasket, open another one out of the box and get going again. Mm -hmm. And Griffin basically nailed that and said, hey, that's Crans. <laughs> You've been portrayed by a number of actors in a number of films. Which one did you like the best? Uh, that's hard to say. Actually, the one that was uh, really started, started a different element of my career was one by uh, PBS and TVSI. It was a documentary to the edge and back. Uh -huh. And uh, that uh, provided a reel that was the... the the question and answer, the preparation for that uh, filming, or that documentary, it was two days of filming. And it was probably the most intense time I'd ever have uh, in an interview. And when we finally finished, I broke into tears at the end of that. And that's what Ed Harris used, mm -hmm. that film, and basically me cracking up right at the end to mm -hmm. sit down at the end of the Apollo 13. They got it, wipe his eyes, he was tearing up there. Yeah. So basically, I think that was the one that basically they used that for uh, raising funds, the dial for dollars, etc. Mm -hmm. I was in uh, Washington, D.C. A lot of my guys retired. We started telling war stories while they're trying to get the money there. And uh, there was a literary agent there that said, this guy's got to write a book. So that documentary basically had many, uh, many aspects of my life. And then I started going on the road with... Uh, uh, Many of the crewmen's Jim Lowell was the principal one, Fred Hayes on occasion, mm -hmm. and basically uh, telling our story and making uh, the space program uh, come alive and be important to the people of the nation. These were the working level devils, these were the very small corporations, and then pretty soon it was Fortune 500. Uh -huh. So we spent uh, many years yeah. telling the story of a, not only Apollo 13, but the space program. Well, I've said many times, the uh, getting those guys back on Apollo 13 was an absolute miracle. What was it like there in the control room when things were really getting grim? It was uh, the first, I'd say, 10 minutes, 15 minutes were the most difficult for me. Because uh, for the first few minutes, the crew had said they had remaster alarms and many emissions. We'd fly the crew to report a master alarm and say, well, that's another electrical problem. We'll put the crew to sleep and we'll work on it. And then a few minutes later, one of my controllers said, there was a pretty big bang associated with that. Mm. And all of a sudden I said, hey, tread lightly. There's something we don't understand here. And then when Jim Lovell was looking outside the hatch window and he says, I think we're vetting something all of a sudden. It was survival mode. Yeah. So it was basically downloading through three different phases in this, what turned out to be a uh, uh, 
incredible emergency that we had never contemplated working. But it was interesting, this team, from the time that this thing started until the crew splashed down and was on board the carrier, were on top of the job every step of the way. Yeah, I interviewed, I had a sit-down interview with five uh, NASA astronauts. This was uh, four or five years ago. And my wife, Laura, came up with the best question. <laughs> she said to ask them, four of those guys had walked on the moon. Jim Lovell, of course, mm -hmm. did not. He was in Apollo 13. But I asked those guys, what was your favorite moon food? Laura <laughs> told me to ask that. Well, I think it was Alan Bean said his was spaghetti, but he was afraid some of the other guys were going to eat his spaghetti before bed. He said uh, it was still there on the moon. It was terrible. And somebody said my favorite was so-and-so. And, -so and and about this time, Jim Lovell speaks up and he says, you guys talking about your favorite food on the moon. All I had was a frozen hot dog. <laughs> and that was, that was on, the, on the way back. And that was true. They almost froze to death inside. Well, what, what, you had to move them into the lunar module, did yes, you? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. Was they, that for they, oxygen or what? It was, well, basically, it was, uh, that was where we had power. Uh -huh. uh, that was our, sort of like a lifeboat in a ship. Okay, you crawl into the lifeboat, you, you have some opportunities for survival there. You had power, you had communications, and basically that was sort of the home base. And a couple times we'd uh, basically orient it so it'd basically warm up a little bit. But basically we're still in passive thermal control. But uh, you ask about the favorite food, mine was ice cream. Uh -huh. Okay, the ice cream they had there. It didn't taste like <laughs> ice cream. It was sort of like a, uh, a foam uh, uh, icicle. Ah. But uh, they came and occasionally we'd get in there and we'd get a surgeon would bring in a package and we'd do some yeah. food testing. Uh -huh. Well, that sounds like, uh, that yeah. sounds like fun. That's really. that, that was. I saw recently Space Center Houston had the unveiling of a new bronze statue of the Apollo 13 astronauts for the 51st anniversary. Was it great to reunite with your crew? I think every, uh, every opportunity we get, we're, uh, we're taking it because we're losing so many of the crewmen. Mm -hmm. uh, we just lost Mike Collins, and uh, mm -hmm. that's uh, uh, a great loss because now we have only one survivor of the first lunar landing. Uh, Mike was the command service module pilot there. But basically, if you start looking at the number of crewmen we lost, I'm losing my controllers. Uh, it's, it's just, we're at that point in life, and we're, to a great extent, blessed because we had a marvelous time growing up and doing the work we had. We had great leaders. We had Chris Kraft, Glenn Lunny was in mission control mm -hmm. in there. So we can always look back and say, we were blessed to live when we did. Yeah. Do you guys get together very often? Every time we get a chance. Uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> it's, we, we have a, uh, uh, we've restored mission control. And in July, we raised money. And we have now in the Air Force Museums I was in and worked with, we donate, and we put in benches in memory of various missions, pilots, training classes right on down the line. Now we're putting three black granite benches outside the visitor entrance in memory of the Gemini Apollo team. Uh -huh. We had the Skylab Soyuz team and then the shuttle team that worked in mission control. And they're going to be flying. Jerry Griffin came up with this. They're going to be in a V shape because the central part was the Gemini Apollo team that worked mm -hmm. in mission control. Yeah. And we hope to have those in place uh, by the July time frame when we have again the 50th anniversary of the lunar landing. Very good. Wonderful. The space program of the 1960s was so remarkable. I will never forget when President John F. Kennedy came to Houston and he made the statement in his speech. Why does Rice play Texas? We, we choose, to, choose go to, to go to the moon, the moon in this, in this decade. decade. Not because it is easy, easy but, because but because it is hard. hard. I interviewed Dr. Chris Kraft uh, several years later, and he said, Dave, that statement from the President of the United States shocked everybody at NASA. 
we were just barely into orbital flight. We hadn't even started on the Gemini program. We uh, didn't have the booster capability. The Saturn V hadn't even been designed yet. He said that blew us all away. But in 1969, they made it. Landed the first man on the moon. It's How does it feel to have been such a key component to this pioneering in the space program? I don't uh, think of it uh, as an individual. I think of it as the team. Uh -huh. uh, the teams in mission control were great, but we were supported by engineers in the mission evaluation room, uh, Max Faget's team that basically was there. We had doctors. They had this, this entire universe of technology and people came together at this time. I'm doing a book now, and the one thing I'm, I'm amazed at are how my people and where they came from. Uh, I had three Native Americans that were working in mission control. Mm -hmm. I had John Aarons portrayed in several movies in there. He was basically a hard scrabble farmer. His father was a rancher. His mother was a circuit riding preacher. Oh. So these were the kinds of people that came in and they came in with a work ethic that basically was incredible. And all we had to do was point them towards an objective and turn them loose. How do you think the space program is going today and how, is, how are things been, and how's it being run? I think they have, uh, they have a set of marvelous opportunities because they have many of the books have been written. The technology is there. You got smart kids. And I think with uh, former Senator Nelson at the helm, I think there's a chance that, uh, yes, we will get back to the moon and the Artemis, Artemis program sometime in this decade. So I think it's going to be in the decade. I think it's not going to be in the near term. And I find that this makes me happy because this will then allow my children and grandchildren to see Americans back on the lunar surface again. Yeah. And once you get to the moon, it's like camping. You learn to live there, and then you can go on beyond that. Yeah. So I think that there's a marvelous time to live and grow up and have the, again, the opportunity to go further, just like we had the opportunity to go further. I was down at the Cape for the very first shuttle launch and the very last shuttle launch and several during the program. What did you think of the discontinuation of the shuttle program? I and uh, many uh, fought terminating sh the shuttle operations uh, very hard. Uh, In fact, uh, when Mike Griffin was the director, I think he was, there was foresight. We saw that the, that the shuttle was a wonderful device. Mm -hmm but it had to be treated with kid gloves. And I think that basically the Constellation program, uh, which we went, and basically I was up in, uh, in Chicago for a media event on that thing with John Glenn, uh, Gene Cernan, we had uh, Jim Lovell, and uh, Neil Hutt, Neil Armstrong. Uh -huh. So we were up there basically saying, we must continue on, we must have um, American launch capabilities. Yeah. Uh, they didn't like this continuing to be totally dependent upon the Russians for those things, the launch services. Yeah. And we fought that and we, we really were sad when it was canceled, the Constellation was canceled. Mm -hmm. A lot of people called it the stick, but basically it had a pretty good uh, first flight test. Yeah. Well, what about the SpaceX program today? I'm really, uh, really, I won't say enthralled is the wrong word, actually surprised that the commercial entity has moved out so fast uh -huh. and uh, developed a lot of the capabilities. But again, the books have been written. You got smart people and you got a new generation of technology. All you need is somebody that says, I'm willing to accept the risk to go do it. So uh -huh. let's put America back in space again. I think it's great. Yeah, I agree. I'll never forget my first launch to witness live down there at the Cape was Gemini Titan III, which was the first manned Gemini launch. And I will never forget 
they put all us reporters in behind little cubby holes up there about three miles from the launch site where we could see it yeah. visibly. And uh, just off uh, away from the vertical assembly building down there, we were reporting on a Gemini rockets were fueled by what they, what they call them, hyperbolic fuels, yeah. two chemicals that once they exactly. uh, mix together, they together ignite. boom, they yeah. ignite instantly. Well, in this particular launch, they got down to zero and fired the thing. One of the rocket engines gimbaled too far, and it shut itself off instantly. Well, we could see, you know, a little puff of smoke, but that's it. Rocket never moved. Mm -hmm. But there was a young guy there from of several Florida radio stations. And as you know, NASA would give you all the information you would yeah. ever want to know about a launch or a flight. He had scripted what he was going to say. <laughs> and he was reading his script. With <laughs> three, four, three, two, one, ignition, liftoff. And the beautiful Gemini Titan rocket soars into the beautiful blue skies over Florida. <laughs> and he looks up and sees that rocket had gone nowhere. Yeah. And he says, oh, 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 two giant hands just reached up and pulled the rocket back <laughs> down on the pad. That broke everybody up down there. I never saw that guy at another launch. I think that was his one and only experience at at a launch. No, there was there was uh, mm. <laughs> there were uh, Jules Bergman. I think we introduced. Oh, yeah. We had really him. Heavy. We had him in Mission Control once, and during a simulation, and this is Jules Bergman reporting, and and uh -huh. everybody looked up and say, "Craft, you know, you shut up over there." <laughs> <laughs> that was the last time we ever had anybody in. Oh, Julie, maybe he was. <laughs> yeah. Well, but you know, it's interesting. We had a professional media cadre. Uh huh. You know, that was the one thing I wish we had the same quality of reporting and knowledge today. Yeah. Because I didn't like those after the shift press conferences because these people knew the mission. They were listening to this thing. They figure out what their questions were, and I think it was far better. I think it was far better service to the public uh -huh. because these people weren't inventing the story; they were writing the story. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is one of the things that uh, basically our nation uh, is not is being not served as well as it should be nowadays. Uh -huh. You have instant news. What you should do is then we had thoughtful news. Yes. I didn't like the midnight press conferences because those guys missed their morning deadline and yeah. they were tough as heck and they had a few more beers than you'd want. <laughs> but uh, it, was, it was really a blast. Yuval Meichler of Texas Mattress Makers immigrated to Houston when he was 18 and is a shining example of what makes Houston so great. It's the people. He's doing great things for our community. Here are a few words from him. If you spend your money and you buy things that are from outside of your community, you're basically taking the good that you can do in your own community and you're distributing it to other places. At Texas Mattress Makers, we make mattresses where we all live. Foam we buy from Brenham, from Waco. Our springs come from Ennis, Texas, which is south of Dallas. Lumber comes from Louisiana. Cardboard from Houston. Plastic from Houston. If I take my money and I spend it overseas or wherever else, I basically stole someone's job here in Texas or Houston. I'm always going to have our community in my forefront when it comes to business. At Texas Mattress Makers, we're the only team in Houston with our own factory. Get your best night's sleep with up to 30% plus free delivery on select mattresses. We do one thing. We create the best mattresses in Texas. It was due to the space program that I was able to move from radio into television. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, I was at the Cape for a launch, but a photographer from Channel 13, a man named John Gabauer, he was there also covering the flight. Well, I was still in radio. So we got together and he showed me how to operate his sound camera, how to focus it, how to zoom in and out, turn it on and off, and this, that, and the other. 
he would set the camera up on its tripod and I never forget, we were interviewing Kenneth Kleinconnect, who was, was some official in the pro space program. Yeah, he was the program manager. Yeah. Yeah. Well, for Gemini. John interviewed him first, and then I interviewed him for radio. And we, that, when we got back, I was down at uh, the Johnson, what's well, now the Johnson Space Center, covering a space flight in a hotel down there. And I got a call from uh, a guy there at Channel 13. It was Gabe. And he told me, Dave, our assistant news director is leaving. He's going to ABC in Atlanta. Uh, there's an opening here for assistant news director. Are you interested? I said, yes, I am. Uh, so when that space flight was over, I came and talked to the news director. It was a guy named Ray Conaway. I did not get the job of assistant news director. That went to Gabe Bauer. But I became the first on the street reporter photographer that Channel 13 ever had. Went to work there November the 6th, 1960, November 9th, 1966. And I was there for 50 years. But had it not been for the space program and me covering it, I doubt that I would have ever made that switch. Ever well, done it, you know, it's interesting that uh, talks about life because I think about how I got into the space program. Uh-huh. Uh, all I wanted was fly fighters. I was flying the yeah. best high-performance airplanes in the world, okay? Yeah. And uh, I was sent to tankers. I didn't want to fly tankers. So I got into flight test. Well, flight test, the program ended. As I was looking around, I saw an advertisement in Aviation Week that said they're forming a space task group. And I thought, gee, that sounds pretty cool. So all of a sudden, mm -hmm. I applied to there. So it's, it's these things here. And I just, I was originally assigned to Goddard. Uh -huh. But uh, somebody read the paperwork there, and I think it was either Kraft or Walt Williams said, hey, we want this guy in the space task group, and that's how I ended up there. It was huh. bloody what? luck. Right, there you go. What do you think we'll be able to accomplish? What's the future of space travel? Will we ever live up there? I think that question, and I think the opportunities, space will continue to issue uh, long-term challenge. Uh, it is there. And people like the oceans will want to go and see and find, and they're going to greater and greater and greater depths. They're finding things. They're right, right now they're recovering many of the uh, ships that were in the major battles of, of World War II. So there is, there is always a challenge to get into the unknown and see what is there. Mm -hmm. I think that the... Uh, JPL and the current Mars program that they've got in there where you had on the anniversary you have a helicopter that yes. weighs only a smidgen of a weight lift off with a camera under uh, control billions of miles away yeah flown by some young lady and you sit down and say boy what a deal! It'd be yeah. great to be born now and have that in front of me. <laughs> well, so, I, so I think that the question is, yes, there is always going to be beckoning there. Whether that will be uh, uh, some place, I think it's going to be a place we would go to camp. Uh, it's like I like to go to the hill country for camping. We were campers as a family. But I was always glad to get back home. Back home, too. yeah. No matter how far out we go. Yeah we're still going to have to come back home. Are there any secrets you can tell us? Any, uh, <laughs> uh, are there actually aliens? Well, uh, I, uh, you know, it's interesting. The, uh, at the time that all the aliens and all these things, I was flying high-performance aircraft over uh, Nellis Air Force Base Federal Weapons School, and there was a place down there called Groom Lake. And this is where they claim that all of these aliens had been corralled and all the UFOs had been put in there. It was highly classified space. We weren't allowed to fly over it. Mm. But uh, I, uh, I was never one that was a believer. I think, yeah. there is a, I think there's a vastness out there. Who knows what's out there? I think, uh, I don't know if we'll ever find mm. out. But mm. uh, it's, it's a legitimate question. Are there other worlds out there? Maybe, maybe there are other places where uh, life exists, whether it's human or what form, I don't know. Uh, but uh, that's an interesting question, but basically, mm -hmm. 
as I'd say in the government, that's beyond my pay grade. Uh, there okay. you go. <laughs> what experiment or discovery during the NASA missions do you think was the most useful or surprising or uh, unusual? I think, I, I don't know if it was a discovery, but I would say is it's, uh, it's the human element. It goes back to a previous question we were talking about, this quest to explore. And I think that uh, the one thing that we found as a result of the space program is that if you turn people loose and issue them a challenge, they cannot only accomplish that. And I look at it sort of like the president's speech last night, what, America, what Americans will dare, Americans will do. And I think that's the kind of, of motivation, challenge that has to be issued to our people. We have to continue to grow. Uh, I think space and the technologies that you develop, the cutting edge technologies are very important to keeping the economic engine of our country going. Uh -huh. And I think space difficult missions produce challenging technology that's hard to copy. Mm -hmm. And I think that challenges the best of America. So I think we must continue to go further, accept the risk. Risk is the issue mm -hmm. that if I would look at our nation today, I'd say, uh, I was just over talking to some of the new astronauts that come in there. And basically, my comments that are sort of frustrated, I don't know why I was frustrated in talking to them, they say, they say uh, you know, you guys, when you have an accident, basically, you don't just stop the program dead. You say, okay, we're continuing on and we're going to do it now. We, we, we spend too much time and effort trying to answer these questions. And always somebody will come back and say, what's well, the wrong culture in your organization, right or not on the line. That isn't a cultural problem. It's somebody made a mistake and they ought to own up to mistake yeah. and then get back on track again. Mm -hmm. I think that was the one thing we found in the Apollo 1 fire. We got back on track quickly and by November, with the accident in January, November, we we're back mm -hmm. launching Saturns. And basically, I think it's time to uh, basically recognize that all progress entails risk. And if you're not willing to risk, you're marching in place. That's true. I'll never forget my first Saturn V launch that I witnessed <laughs> down there at the Cape. Gee, it was like, it was like watching the Umbo building go straight <laughs> up in the air and disappear into, I mean, and the, the sound from those things. Yes. You, when it first fired off, you couldn't hear it. We were about three miles away, of course. You didn't hear it until it was up about like so. And when it got up to about a 45 degree angle, you felt it in your chest. Ba boom, ba boom, boom, ba boom, 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 ba boom, 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 boom. An unforgettable experience to witness those things. Oh, just well, so it, much. It, you know, it's interesting. I thought it was the Saturn was majestic. Uh, you know, as flight director, it takes 10 seconds to clear that tower. And during that period of time, the launch director and the flight director have abort responsibility if there's a problem. And all you want to do is say, come on, baby, yeah. go clear that tower. And then you, you hear tower clear, you say, it's mine, all right. ready to go. Yep, there you go. I was really sorry to hear about the passing of Glenn Lunny. Uh, he was, you'd been through so much together for quite some time, and I know that had to be tough. Laura and I send you our deepest condolences. Uh, he was a good friend of yours, wasn't he? Yes, we were. In fact, it was, uh, you know, you hear this term, it, it's misused many times, Band of Brothers. Uh, and I think Kraft formed the Band of Brothers. And basically had myself and John Hodge uh, Chris Kraft and Glenn were the first four. Mm -hmm. And then we had others that came into this band to uh, replace us as people moved into industry, they moved to other locations, NASA. But we never lost that relationship that existed in it. It, it basically worked. We shared risk. And in mission control, I would hand over a problem to Glenn 
He'd work it, he'd hand it over until finally somebody would come up with an answer. But at, at no time did we ever think it's an I problem, it's a we problem. Yeah. Okay, we are the people that must come up with the answer. And, uh, you know, whether we had presidents that show up after a mission or you go to the, the hill country for, for, uh, uh, to meet the president, uh, basically it, it's okay, that's fine. Mm. And you're celebrating me, but basically what you're celebrating is what my team did. Yeah. Okay, so it, it's a team thing. Well, you have quite a legacy. I'm sure your children and grandchildren now know. Well, you were just telling me that you're about to have an airport named after you. <laughs> Where is that again? It's in uh, Toledo, Ohio. In fact, it's the, I think it's the 20th. And uh -huh. I got to figure out some speech we're going to give. It's Toledo Municipal. I have a uh, uh, high school, Toledo Central Catholic, as I want to got my lunar rock as Ambassador uh -huh. of Exploration. Uh, basically, uh, I didn't give it to uh, museums. I gave it to my high school because that's where my life as a professional began. Uh -huh. Where these teachers taught me, they got me the uh, appointment for the Naval Academy. But when that failed, they found a, a, a opportunity, a college loan program, Ohio Elks Association, that was provide $500 per semester. And think about that, $500 a semester nowadays for going to college. Mm -hmm. But they found that, and that's, that all started at that high school. Mm -hmm. And it's a uh, magnificent place. They have uh, basically my key set from the console. They have the flag that I had. My, once you become a SES kind of person, uh, basically you get your own flag right or not. This is a flag, though, that one of my, I uh, had a uh, employee, uh, it was sort of like a, a military supply sergeant. Uh, he could find things. And uh, one day he found me a flag. He says, you need a flag. Because the secretaries used to call me General Savage from the, uh, from the uh, TV show they had in uh, there about the B-29s. And they put it on the door and they changed my office and they couldn't get it off the door, so they put the door in backwards. So instead of opening into the office, it up on, into the hallway. So. <laughs> They got that flag and it's got uh, the one thing I did in high school, and this, I, I don't think I was a prophet, but I wrote a term paper back in 1950 on the design and possibilities of an interplanetary rocket. Okay, 1950, and I was pretty good in the science that went into it. And uh, the original is back at my high school because that's, uh -huh. I wrote that I got a 97. I can't figure out what, where I lost the three points, but it was pretty good. <laughs> wow. And behind you is my hero's wall. These are the people that uh, basically inspired, grew up with, including my wife, my grandkids. Mm. Uh, it's just been great. You know, I can't believe that I'm now 88 and still <laughs> chunking along. I feel like <laughs> I'm going to keep going forever. Uh, well, I hope you do. Yeah, I hope I so, do. too. Dave, thank, thank you. thank you. Enjoyed it. Thank you so Great. much for this. And thank you for tuning in to Dave Ward and Friends. Dave Ward and Friends is proud to be supported by the brand new 135,000 plus square foot Porsche River Oaks dealership from our friends at Sonic Automotive. I've known a lot of Porsche owners in my time, and one thing they've told me is that they really enjoy sitting down and specking out the Porsche of their dreams. The newly opened River Oaks Porsche will not only allow you to do that, but Porsche North America has broadened the allocation of all model types just for this new state-of-the-art River Oaks facility. General Sales Manager Kerry Jo McCrory and her entire team are excited to get you into the personalized Porsche of your dreams. It's now open in River Oaks. Tell them Dave Ward sent you. <laughs>